This podcast is made possible by Avalara. Hi, this is Celine Dufatel, CFO and COO of Checkout.com, and you're listening to CFO Thought Leader. This is episode 871. I, I work cross-functionally to develop a market map and understand the trends, historical and, and emerging, in FP&A. And one of those trends, of course, is XP&A, or planning outside of the Office of Finance, planning other than in general ledger codes. And that is inclusive of things like what I mentioned about the SDR team. They plan in number of dials needed to get a connect and how long they're on, on a phone call. And they resource their group around those metrics. And one of the areas that struck us as very, very ripe for an elevated uh, amount of tooling and education around planning was marketing. So marketing, traditionally one of the biggest cost centers. I think many finance people will nod their heads when I say a bit of a black box, takes a lot of investment, and there's not a great way, at least historically, to understand the return on that investment. Hi, it's Jack. On today's show, we speak with Dan Fletcher, CFO of Planful. During the early years of his finance career, Dan Fletcher was accustomed to being the executive from somewhere else. When he joined the asset management team at Allstate Investments, he was the auditor from Pricewaterhouse. And when he landed inside an interim management role as a private equity advisor, he was the former investor turned operator. For its part, Fletcher's early career journey is a standout, not just because he achieved the finance triad of auditor, investor, and operator, but because of the speed at which he was able to pivot from one to the next. According to Fletcher, such pivots require careful, reflexive relationship building, where in the end, as Fletcher explains, people were willing to bet on me. We'll hear that story and much more on today's episode. We begin after this. If you're responsible for the financial well-being of any company, you've probably have heard about Avalara. Since 2004, Avalara's vision has been to harness the power of cloud technology to help simplify sales tax for businesses of all sizes. Avalara's solutions are designed to affordably scale with businesses as they grow over time. Tax compliance is not a revenue-generating activity. So Avalara's technology is designed to help you manage tax compliance as efficiently and accurately as possible so you can reclaim your valuable time and reduce risk in your business. With more than a 1,000 signed partner integrations, Avalara likely integrates with the ERP, e-commerce, mobile payment, and point-of-sale systems you use today. Find out how your business can be sales tax ready at avalara.com slash leader. Avalara. Tax compliance done right. Hello, we're speaking with Dan Fletcher, CFO of Planful. Dan, welcome. Well, thank you, Jack. I'm a fan of the podcast, so I'm excited to be here with you today. That's great to hear, Dan. So as we always do, we begin by asking you to look back and sharing some of those experiences you feel prepared you for this role. What would those be? And so I'll tell you a bit about my career in chapters. It's maybe a little bit more zigging and zagging than most CFOs who may have come up through the corporate finance or corporate accounting track, although there are many ways to get to the CFO chair, investment banking, private equity. I started out my career in auditing as a CPA with a bachelor's and master's of accounting with great firm, the firm uh, PwC. That's some free press as an alumni for, for PwC. 
And I spent three years there auditing the big capital markets clients, the banks. Um, I'm not na- not going to name names, but you know the blue bloods. And that was in the Great Recession. And so I learned uh, just a ton, uh, uh, kind of live bullets, uh, baptism by fire, you might say, about debt and and risk and credit risk and global interconnected capital markets. And it was a great stint. You know, my intention. Jack, and I, I do mean this, was never to stay in audit. There's nothing at, at all uh, wrong with that profession, but it was meant to me to teach me. It was almost a continuation of school. Drop into different businesses, learn comprehensively about their systems, their financials, their business model, um, and then learn how to learn. Uh, the, great, the big four are great at teaching people. And so after three years, and that was chapter one as an auditor for the big four, working with the big financial institutions, I wanted to be an investor. And that's a hard pivot to make. And I, I basically, I made it through personal relationships that I fostered throughout those first three years um, and relying on some of my education and internships back in school, pivoted into investing uh, first at the asset manager level with all state investments and later with the middle market private equity firm in the classic two-year associate role. Uh, and I think that's important later because those are two total totally different disciplines, you know, viewing businesses outside in from an auditor's perspective, where you're trying to mainly validate the financial statements and and give a good standing, and then pivoting to an investor where you're mainly concerned with returns. So very different uh, incentives and frameworks for understanding a business. Those were chapters one and two. And then uh, true to the sort of zigging and zagging of the first pivot, I pivoted into what would be operating. And so I I couldn't get immediately an operating role in private equity. Those are usually reserved for folks who are very experienced, have often held C-suite roles. And so I knew I had to go cut my teeth. And I did so at Alvarez and Marcel in their private equity performance group, which focuses on a couple of things. But one of them is interim management uh, post-acquisition and with a lens 100% on performance improvement. So I would drop into a business as the VP finance or the global controller once the director of marketing, and execute on the 100-day plan for a number of big uh, private equity sponsors. And and that was very uh, formative, high-pressure environment, lots of different business models from, you know, the, the, the construction product distribution field to the medical device field, to the technology field, to a veterinarian chain. Um, and then, you know, this is a long-winded, so I'm going to pause here, Jack, but I carried through that operator's role, but instead got into tech and landed here as CFO Planful. So when you land there, though, at A&M, does your background resemble your peers? And I imagine it's a mixed bag there. But how did you make that transition? Was it, again, you resembled uh, the backgrounds of others or or no? Were you kind of a, a different breed there as well? Yeah, I was a different breed. I think the thing that helped me there is this was a group called Private Equity Performance Improvement. And I came from private equity. And so I had a good portion of the equation. You know, the people paying the bills, the private equity, I understood very well their motivations, what a deal model looks like, the, the things around revenue synergies and, and cost synergies that are pivotal to making a successful private equity investment. What I did not have was sitting in, I think this is probably what you're getting at, Jack, sitting inside a business as a leader, as a VP or as a director of FP&A, for example. And I do think that similar to the way in my investment pivot, it required a lot of um, a lot of careful fostering of relationships to get people to take a bet on my capabilities in that role. The same was true pivoting from investing to operating within a business. It took a lot of vetting. I think I interviewed with about 20 different people and a lot of research on my own. And look, that's the blessing of the internet is there are no, is no shortage of material out there on how to thrive in given roles, what makes people successful, what to avoid doing, uh, both on the soft and hard skills point of view. And so that pivot was, um, yep, untraditional. But to answer your question, no, I did not look like everybody else. At that place in time, are you becoming tech is your sector? Have you decided this is it? This is going to be where I'm, I'm going to build my career? Or were you less industry specific at that point? I was completely industry agnostic in, in the group at Alvarez and Marsal, in the, in the PEPI group, Private Equity Performance Improvement. 
However, I would say it traces back all the way to my days at PwC. This is 2007, 2008. And as you know, Jack, from your hundreds of interviews with CFOs and, and financial leaders, technology has had a bit of a slow start in the finance and accounting department relative to, say, sales and marketing or the product sides of most businesses. But that said, that's right about the time when it really started to take off. In the 2007s, you had uh, folks like Hyperion and certainly uh, NetSuite and Adaptive Insights taking off and, and also my company, Planful. And so I noticed it early on, technology. I started to see it more. I started to understand how it optimized results and provided better outcomes, saved people work, also grew things like the top line. It can have a value of creation role as well if it's providing the right insights and decision-making support. And so I just sort of slowly fell in love with it. Think of it as like a decade-long, uh, slow-burning love affair where I started to understand technology was where more innovation and therefore more value creation and excitement was happening relative to some of the older industries like banking and um, law, for example. And again, you were with A and M in Chicago. You come west, and you and you join Vector. Just curious as to whether this move represents a milestone as you look back. I'm sure it does, but what would you tell us? I would say that's that's an accurate reading of it. With with one caveat, you know, my my now wife, but my girlfriend at the time would disagree that I was in Chicago when I was with A and M because you go where the work is. And I know that sounds antiquated in a post COVID world where. We're so remotely enabled, but at the time you were traveling nearly every week out to different states or Europe to be where the deal was, where the HQ or the subsidiary offices were, and all work was almost done. It was almost embarrassing to suggest a conference call take the place of an in-person meeting. Uh, you remember that, uh, Jack, that environment. Um, you know, it was considered lazy to suggest, why don't we just do this on a call? You were meant to show up and be a part of the culture, be a part of the team. And so I was everywhere. Now, that said, your question is a point in one. The, the, the final pivot from being industry agnostic into tech, uh, super unorthodox, right? I think a lot of tech people start in tech and, and matriculate through the ranks in tech. It's its own niche world, uh, similar to most industries, hard to break through from you know running a veterinarian practice, for example, into tech. But I, I do think that I had gained tech experience at, in, in PE investing. I knew about virtually the entire CFO tech market map at that point. And I exclusively chose to interview with PE technology firms uh, for all the reasons I listed above, more innovation, more excitement. Um, and certainly tech has its faults. That could be another podcast where we discuss you know, doesn't a business need to make money for it to be a good business um, and so on, right? But it, I still stand by that decision almost four years ago now that tech is a great place to be and will continue to be a great place to be if you want to be on the cutting edge. Now, you have a, a, an entrance, uh, an interesting entrance uh, to the CFO office. I'd like you to share it. There have been quite a few uh, what we would refer to as interim CFOs um, and I've seen pluses and minuses, or, or so CFOs have told me, um, there are pluses and minuses to it, mostly pluses. Share your story as to how Vector sort of opened the door to CFO opportunities for you. Certainly. And so in, in private equity, there are often two sides of the house. You've got the classic investment team and you have an operating team. And there are more sides of the house. I don't want to let down the folks who run the fund accounting and, and all of that good stuff. But um, but fundamentally, the, the outward facing groups, one is focused on doing the deals and the other is focused on improving the deals once they're done. And that's the side that I re-entered when I came back into PE. And one of the, the uses for me, given my experience a, in different financial seats from the VP level, the director level, and, and also cross-functional and marketing and IT uh, one of the uses for me was to plug into portfolio companies with very close alignment to the investment thesis. And that's how I landed in an interim role in, in 2018 at what was then Host Analytics. The company, of course, has gone through tremendous growth and rebranded as Planful, introduced new products, innovated far beyond what it was back at that time, um, which I'm sure you know, being across the CFO tech space, but that was my my job at the time was interim. You come in, you spend a year, year and a half, you execute on a, a variety of performance improvement initiatives, help get a really good and talented team attracted to the business, help them thrive. And then 
you know, ideally you ride off and do it again somewhere else. Let's jump to our business segment where I get to ask you about Planful so you can fill us in on the company's continued to grow. It's expanded. It's made some key acquisitions. But tell us about Planful today. What is this company about? What's happening? I'll take all the time you'll give me. I'm quite the evangelist for the product. I'm a, I'm a user of the product myself, obviously, um, and, and I'm very excited about the trajectory the company has taken and continues to, to ride. Uh, and so fundamentally, what does Planful do? Planful helps you plan, organi- organization-wise, helps you plan in an automated and agile fashion. It helps you close the books faster with fu- functionality that our, our audience here on the CFO Thought Leader will understand is consolidation and financial close. And then it helps you report. Report in gap financials, report in management reporting, report operationally, KPIs, dashboards, whatever you want, right? And so it's the soup to nuts platform for finance and accounting and increasingly for other departments, including marketing, uh, HR or people teams, uh, depending on who you ask and IT, uh, because everybody plans. And and this is not news to you, Jack, but the the category that that we operate in this sort of FP&A software category has increasingly become more cross-functional and and sells to uh, all the C-suite, different operational leaders throughout the business, because I'll say it one more time, everybody does planning, but not everybody has the right tools to do it. Dan, could you give us maybe an abbreviated history of Planful's capital structure going back in time? And you mentioned host analytics. That's part of the history. Certainly. So Planful was like many Silicon Valley startups, uh, bootstrapped for a short period of time, call it five years, and then matriculated into the VC-backed ranks that is so typical of Silicon Valley and raised several series of VC-backed money and achieved quite a lot of success, uh, but did not take the IPO path. It was market timing. It was other competitive um, pressures. And so decided instead to exit to a private equity backer that could help it realize its full potential. And that is where the business is today, you know, with best in class growth metrics and, you know, great uh, market reputation, at least I think so. And and other analysts think so. Um, And so, that's the, that's the path. And that is not an uncommon path for technology companies. Um, with the difference there being at the end, there are multiple, you can SPAC, you can IPO, you can die, or you can be acquired by a strategic, or you can finally uh, be backed by a later stage investment group, uh, such as private equity or growth equity. So stepping back into the role, what is this chapter that you want to help open for Planful? Uh, you 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 know it's earlier chapter so well. What is this chapter that you're joining? I think it's interesting too. We know that there was a, a recent acquisition. Um, the vision has has broadened, perhaps. I don't know how you'd characterize it. What would you share with us? Certainly. So I'll say the the acquisition. I think that probably makes sense to explore, you know, further down the line. But I can talk about what has happened at the company over the last four years. And, and one of the obvious things that happened is the company rebranded to more closely align its name, literal name and brand, with what our customers do in the, in the platform. You know, God bless uh, the, the pre- previous name, but you couldn't find much, um, you know, quick recognition on the street with what that company did. So I'm not even going to say the old name. But Planful, it really does accurately describe what this business does. It, this business is about intelligently planning and operating your, your, your enterprise. And there, sure, there are other things that happen underneath that. You need to close the books to get actual performance. Actuals versus plan is one of the ways you understand what's happening in your business. Um, you need to be quick in reporting and be automated so that your team isn't spending hours and hours every month wrangling data and producing what are ultimately perhaps inaccurate and slow time to user reports. And so fundamentally what's happened over the last four years is a couple of things. Number one, rebranding. Number two, mu- many, many, many releases on the product roadmap that uh, bring the company into the forefront of the category. So in, in things like, uh, Jack, predictive analytics, right? We have an algorithm that will do two things for you. It's, a, it's literally called predict, the planful predict. It will do one thing that finance teams hate doing, which is error detection and review. So it will look across every single data point in a report, in a grid-based plan, in a financial model, and it will highlight anomalies based on your data model. 
and surface those to you so that you can spend your time looking at things that aren't obviously correct. Um, and that helps you do two things. One, explain variances. So think of it as helping you write your mDNA and two, help you catch errors. And errors can surface in, in a planful like product because everything that happens upstream, accounting entries that are made, um, you know, in the ERP, for example. And so that, that's what I'm talking about with the roadmap. And then the other things we did were, um, dramatically accelerate into international business in particular English speaking international markets, but beyond that as well, have done really well in the UK, continental Europe and Australia, for example, and then also work with more partners. You know, software, although Plantful is much quicker to implement than uh, other other solutions in the, in the market, uh, not to denigrate those solutions, but it's one of our value propositions is that we're finance, accounting, marketing, HR owned, as in we do not need IT support, and we're very quick time to value, purpose built out of the box. Um, and so, but if you're going to have high growth, which Planful has had now for three years, you need partners to help you implement, or you're going to end up running a consulting firm in your own company. And so we expanded our channel. We have resellers now. We have partners who implement us and, and so on. And so I would say those three things, innovated on the roadmap, four things. Uh, so you think a CFO could count, rebranded to more align with what we do in the market, innovated on the roadmap with especially predictive AI and ML capabilities, expanded internationally and expanded our partner ecosystem. We, we are discovering that finance leaders are paying closer attention to certain business dynamics. And you mentioned uh, earlier things that are catching, you know, errors that people are catching and what have you. That type of visibility, has it allowed you to see certain things that you've decided need to be measured more frequently or need to be revealed to the organization more broadly so people can change their behaviors? Or, But is there a business dynamic that you've helped to raise the profile of within Planful to help the business uh, react quicker, operate differently? Don't know. Anything? Anything come to mind? Certainly. I, I think there were two topics there that are interesting to me. The first one was uh, reference back to uh, Planful Predict and, and the AI, the algorithm that, that we can use to take some of the load off finance teams for error detection and also to forecast. And, and I use that more of a triangulation capability. But let's set that aside and, and go back to the, the more, at least I think, interesting topic personally, which is these next level metrics. Have I embraced any of these as a financial leader and elevated them in the org to help improve decision making? And I just spent two days ago a lot of time with our business development group. And so this is not unique to software businesses, but fairly common in software businesses. And, and that's that you'll have a group of folks who are generating demand by calling on prospects, right? And they're called SDRs or BDRs in the software world. You could just call it cold calling in, in other industries. And I know this is not a novel concept that just technology adheres to, but it's very common. One of the horsemen, so to speak, for demand generation, in addition to all the things you see marketing folks do, like webinars and user conferences and road shows and and um, even things like podcasts, Jack, <laughs> even things like podcasts, uh, sponsoring podcasts, right? And so, but this this particular zone. group, you know, you often will see big businesses with just armies of these super high energy, often young, but not always folks that are using dialer machines uh, to finally get connected with someone out there. And then for Planful's example, maybe saying, you know, how do you do your planning and reporting? And if the answer is we do it in Excel, you say, how that's going? How's that going for you? And they say, well, some days it's great, some days it breaks, right? And then you say, well, what if we could get you out of that and you use Excel for what it's meant to be used for, which is great ad hoc modeling and real quick calculator stuff and not for the, the durable or persistent processes that over time, if you repeat them enough, they just break without the right enablement, right? And so that's how you start the conversation. Now, most people would say, all right, well, what do you look at as relates to those uh, teams? You look at the financial metrics. That's a pipeline question. Well, how many uh, dollars of pipeline have they created in certain segments? And how fast does that convert? And with what efficacy does it convert into bookings? And that helps you build a pipeline production model and understand how much dollars you need to spend on that team 
on demand generation. But there's a whole universe of really geeky and wonderful metrics that are next level for that group, such as how many dials, um, what is the pickup rate, what is the conversation rate in terms of folks who will stay on the phone over 30 seconds. And then there's also, there are tools out there that are natural language processors that can capture recurring themes that, that the prospect on the other end will bring up. And so there are all these very cool metrics that just because we live in such a digital information age, we're able to capture, keep well organized, often within the planful tool as underlying drivers of our business. And why that's helpful is it can let you know things like, do you have market fatigue? Are people starting to hang up on you quicker? Right. We, we in our market are not seeing that. Right. But you could yeah. see where some markets that are very mature could experience market fatigue. Um, and, and other things like, you know, uh, how many dials does it take to create an actual opportunity? And so those are the type of metrics I've been um, really excited about for probably the past year, year and a half, Jack. So let me let me ask you something about uh, the FP&A expertise at Planful and whether, you know, you've architected or deployed your talent a little differently than other organizations. Do you have a different mindset when it comes to managing FP&A people and hiring FP&A people? And, you know, what would you share? Can you reflect a little on that? It's evolved over time. Even in my four years with Planful, it has evolved as I've evolved as a, as a leader. I think that there are a couple of things that you'll hear many. It won't just be me. You've heard this from. I think you've probably done almost 900 uh, podcasts uh, around this, Jack. I was looking at your episodes, it's high 800. So that means you've got something like, what, 45,000 minutes? Uh, a lot. <laughs> you've got a lot of hours, probably seven, 800 hours. So you've probably heard this before, but it, it's 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 about a couple of things. So I very much focus on business partnering, and 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 that means do you understand the business enough to be dangerous and have good conversations with executives out in the business? Will they pull you in to conversations and meetings because they can use your knowledge? So that's one. It's how smart are they on the industry, on the space, on the product? so that they can talk the language and be useful. And the second one is, no surprise, technology and data science. You know, Are they able to leverage technology to process large volumes of data? I think that's basically table stakes, as certainly for technology, FP&A. Um, and notice what you didn't hear there is you know, the classic things like, have they been involved in a budget compliance process before? Or are they any good at doing monthly expense reviews with uh, budget owners? And all that is important. Do not get me wrong. It is also table stakes. But I do think it's relatively commodity. We've got great educational institutions and, and in corporate finance, you learn all of those things. But to get to that next level, and certainly we expect and demand that next level of capability internally at Planful, and we better because we're supposed to be a shining example to our customers of what finance and FP&A can look like. Um, those are the two things I fixate on obsessively in, in the hiring process. Number of, a number of your top FP&A experts at Planful are in a conference room down the hall from Dan. Dan comes walking down, swings open the door. What crosses their mind? What is Dan going to ask? Oh, no, here it comes. <laughs> the first thing that would cross their mind is, whoa, we're in the office today? This is a remote company. <laughs> now, uh, in, in a physical setting, it's a little different, right? Um, so that threw me for a loop. But it's always what's the latest forward looking view on all the key metrics. So we start every Monday, my controller, my VP finance and I, there's no division between accounting and, and FP&A in, in, in my orgs. Like they are partners. And in fact, I have accounting running multiple forward looking um, models, uh, specifically around cash flow, working capital, things of that sort that are a bit more treasury focused. But they're partners, and the three of us are partners. And we start every Monday with a full refresh because our forecasting models are live. We take live feeds from our CRM, live feeds from our ERP, and so on. We take a look at whatever the live view is. We understand what may have changed in the last week, and we understand what the insights and recommendations that we are going to take out of this Monday and out to our stakeholders in the business are. We start every week with the sell what's. Right. We're, okay. So it looks like cash flow has dramatically improved. 
Why is that? Well, our collections initiative is working out. So that means we have a little bit more liquidity than we thought we'd have. So now let's talk about what we can do with that. What ought we to do with that? Maybe we should go hire five more SDRs. <laughs> and so it's that kind of, of meeting. And I love that. It's, it's truly where the rubber meets the road in business improvement. I want to just touch on talent with you quickly then. Uh, you know, during COVID, you mentioned, of course, uh, how the environment's really changed uh, for a lot of organizations. Have you changed your mindset when it comes to organizational talent, not just finance, not just the finance function, but more broadly, how it's compensated, how uh, maybe it has to do with employee engagement? Is finance going to play a larger role here in how organizations manage and reward their people going forward? Again, another topic that could be explored for 60 minutes. Uh, where, where to even start on that? So to the, to the very pointed question you gave me, will finance be more important in labor considerations? Although that word, a lot of people, talent considerations, right? Whichever you choose. No, I don't think so. I still think other groups, the people, HR team, the CEO are more important. That's not an, an insult to finance. Um, certainly finance plays a key role in compensation. But what I will tell you as, as, a, as a leader of my teams, and I have noticed this is not unique to my team, you become much more interested in engagement. You use the word and, and happiness and fit in the org when you don't see people every day. Things slip. I think we're beyond the point now where we all understand there are benefits to remote or hybrid models. You, you drop the commute out, you know, tend to live healthier lifestyles. Um, perhaps get more time with family and friends, and that's good for mental health. And we also, I think, are beyond the point where we understand certain things that are lost in a 100% remote model around culture, around engagement, in particular for junior ranks, around the ability to learn by seeing, to learn by hearing, um, to learn from random interactions in the hallway or the classic water cooler. And so I think we're all adapting now to finding the right balance and how to recover some of those things we've lost while preserving some of the things we've gained. And I do think in our example, it came down to, if you're saving budget on a big office, then redeploy, reinvest in getting people together, getting people on planes. And we do a great company kickoff that's coming up in just two weeks that, that our people leader, um, Mel, who's fantastic, um, invests a ton of time and energy in getting buttoned up and getting everybody to kick off the year together. And that's the key word, physically together to get swept up in the excitement about what we're doing for our customers and why we're doing it. Um, and then that's where you get a bunch of those random interactions. And this is where you'll find things like some someone in my org, a, a junior accountant, for example, on the AP side, gets to spend time with the CMO at the bar, at the hotel. And next time that CMO is griping about an invoice not being paid and, you know, they're going to someone in AP that they don't know, there's already a bond and understanding there. And they can skip past the part where they're butting heads and get to the part where that, cost, that, that vendor was um, signed up on really, really cushy payment terms to that vendor. And we'd love to have you go talk to them about something that's more commercial for us. And, and that is just one example of the interactions that can occur in person. Even though you all go back to a remote model after that, you've gained something that had been lost, I think, in the, in the depth of the pandemic. Excellent. Thank you for that. We're going to jump to uh, what we refer to as our signature question, where we ask you for a finance strategic moment. And again, Dan, this might have come to you anytime during the course of your career, it's your lines of sight as a finance leader allowed you to see something, pursue something, avoid something, a risk, whatever it may have been. What comes to mind when we ask for a finance strategic moment? Earlier, I mentioned that we might find uh, room to talk about that acquisition uh, that Planful did in September of 2022. And this strikes me as a very good strategic moment uh, for your audience. And so I, I have as a CFO and like many of our listeners do not only finance and accounting, but some other responsibilities. And this is nothing new for CFOs now over the past decade or two that they've become more multidisciplinary, more cross-functional. And I love it for the role of CFO. So I own also legal and also corporate development. And corporate development is the group in many companies and certainly our company that assesses 
the product in partnership with product marketing and, and the actual product management group and, and begins to develop a sense of where we have gaps that we could fill to better serve our customers. And also, of course, to grow our own business and, and create value for our shareholders. And so that is a strategic function for me. I, I work cross-functionally to develop a market map and understand the trends, historical and, and emerging in FP&A. And one of those trends, of course, is XP&A or planning outside of the Office of Finance, planning other than in general ledger codes. And that is inclusive of things like what I mentioned about the SDR team. They plan in number of dials needed to get a connect and how long they're on, on a phone call. And they resource their group around those metrics. And one of the areas that struck us as very, very ripe for an elevated uh, amount of tooling and education around planning was marketing. So marketing, traditionally one of the biggest cost centers. And I think many finance people will nod their heads when I say a bit of a black box, takes a lot of investment, and there's not a great way, at least historically, to understand the return on that investment. Sure, you can measure things like revenue and and amount of dollars spent on marketing per dollar of revenue you get. But those are just two total disconnected. They're, the one is at the very tip and one is at the very end. And there's a whole bunch of metrics in between there that can be understood and planned around. And so what does marketing do when they, when they get on an annual basis? Let me step back. On an annual basis, you run the financial planning, the budget process. And, and if finance is good at what they do, they're partnering with each of the departments, including marketing, to develop what marketing thinks they need to spend on things like programs and, and humans that year um, and events, et cetera. But then traditionally they lock in on a number and then they hand it, they being finance, hands it over to marketing. The board approved, you have $10 million to spend on programs. But then it's a black box to finance, right? And what marketing will do, well, they will take that $10 million and they will cascade that out into campaigns and they'll resource those campaigns with people, with PR resources, with ad spend, with content, um, content creation, content management. Um, the, if there are any CMOs listening, I'm doing my best on what you guys do. But that, that it's that campaign level planning. But they don't even have the ability to completely link the outcomes of those campaigns. How much did that event, that webinar we did generate for us in terms of lead flow? There are swim lane issues and, and et cetera. So this just screams for technology. Like it's 2023. We have the technology to be able to link the finance plan cascade that into campaigns, and then link the ROI from things like the CRM and the ad networks. And what we found when we went out, my corp dev function and I, into the market was that a company called Plana, P-L-A-N-A-N-N-U-H, Boston company, some of you will get that joke, uh, Planner, Plana, and, and they were doing this. They were a relatively early stage startup, but they had built the perfect mousetrap to take what finance gives a marketer plan it out the way marketers actually run their business and track the ROI. And it was an aha moment, a finance strategic moment that the founder and I both saw the synergies between what FP&A planning uh, platforms do and what that marketing performance management platform did. And we said, this is one plus one equals five. It's not even one plus one equals three. It, it will closely interlink finance and marketing for maybe the first time in the history of business. And uh, it's been very successful so far. So that deal closed in September and it's been off to the races. We've now got a couple common customers selling into Planful's relatively large customer base and uh, certainly have been out in the market pounding, uh, you know, pounding the, the table saying that every finance and marketing team should be should be wanting this to help improve their alignment and help them speak the same language. Hello, and welcome to 60 Second Stories from CFO Thought Leader. Back in 1993, Don Alvarez was an auditor with Deloitte San Francisco office when specialty retailer and coveted client company West Marine went public. For Alvarez, the day entailed having West Marine's management execute the novel steps to price its offering, followed by a trip to a Bay Area printer. The long day turned into a long night, so when West Marine's CFO offered Alvarez a lift back to the accounting house's office Alvarez quickie accepted. The night was not yet over for the young auditor. As Deloitte's offices came into view, West Marine's CFO pulled his car over and offered Alvarez a controller position at the newly public company. 
Alvarez replied yes on the spot, allowing him to advance down the CFO path. You'll hear that story and much more on episode number 867, featuring Don Alvarez, CFO of Syngen. Excellent. Thank you for that, Dan. We want you, uh, as uh, our first question in the mentoring round, we always ask you to look back again. We want you to think back to your first 30 days as a CFO. And again, this is for CFOs who are uh, new and uh, those who are about to enter the office in the near future. What is the piece of advice you would give yourself when you think back to that first 30 days you were doing this job, first 60 days? There's so much to learn, I'm sure, but what what is it that you would tell yourself? The thing that jumps out the most at me is to be an expert at your own business from the beginning, from the jump. And what I mean by that is I benefited from having been able to learn about what was then host analytics, what is now planful from the outside in to a, a, a fairly large extent. But it's nothing like what I would recommend right now. I would say that for a CFO, for anyone aspiring to be a CFO, that you really ought to know as much about your business as any other human on the planet. And let that, that sink in. You know, Other than perhaps your CEO, you need to be an expert, soup to nuts, on your business. And that means everything about your business. The market. Let's start with the total addressable market. How penetrated is it? How is it changing over time? Let's start with the competitive set. Who are you winning and, and losing against? What are the swim lanes? Are some companies attacking certain industries or certain customer segments? And then get to your company. Take a look at the product. Understand its strengths and weaknesses. Understand how that's changed over time. And what you'll find is if you really do all of this research and you become an internal expert, that your entire worldview will change. First of all, you'll simply be far better at your core job of planning and reporting on that business and helping guide it strategically. And second, you'll be pulled in cross-functionally by product, by product marketing, by sales, because you know everything there is to know about your business. You're an internal expert. And those synergies produced from those interactions almost can't be quantified. They're, they're so positive. And, and lastly, I really believe this, uh, not to be too squishy, but your personal sense of worth and fulfillment in your job is entirely different when people seek you out and when you're able to help them add value uh, in, in ways unexpected for a finance leader in the business. And so I'll just spoil that all down to one thing. I would do a heavy, heavy diligence, the best diligence you've ever done on your own business and industry before you really start making decisions and really ramp up your kind of 100-day plan in, in a CFO seat. Excellent. Thank you for that. We're going to ask you, as we always do, uh, to reflect a little bit on the personal side, uh, Dan. We wonder if you have a habit or some sort of routine that you're known for over time. This is something maybe a, a family member would point out before uh, a colleague necessarily. It's something you've always, something you're known for, personal habit or routine, anything come to mind? I think it's pretty evident in, in the career path we walked through with all the different four or five chapters that I'm extremely curious about uh, other adjacent disciplines and, and, and industries that I have nothing to do with. And, and I think that the personal habit that has benefited me as an outgrowth of that is I'm just a voracious reader. I mean, it is shocking. You know, I understand that Twitter is undergoing a decent amount of uh, political uh, uh, kind of agita these days, but even just take Twitter and LinkedIn, for example, it, it, the world uh, of knowledge is entirely at our fingertips. And there are thought leaders out there like yourself, Jack, but like others who will take the time on a weekly, daily basis to post very incredibly thoughtful questions and, and surface knowledge. Um, I'll give you an example. You go on LinkedIn, you can't throw a stone and hit somebody who says, here's something I wish I knew. As, as a leader, here's a fun dashboard on how to run an annual budget cycle. Even if I know this, it's someone else's view on how to do that. And it's incredibly interesting. And I think keeps me on the cutting edge of what I do, whether it's in finance or marketing or, or other, other disciplines. So say curiosity and then the energy to follow up that curiosity by reading voraciously. Excellent. Well, that's a great segue where we ask you for a book recommendation. If it's um, 
Uh, it doesn't have to be a business book. It might be something you uh, you escape with. Uh, anything come to mind? So there's there's one I recently finished and one that's waiting for me at home. And I'll, I'll touch on, on both of them. So the one that I finished was actually suggested to me by my CEO, Grant Halloran. It's called Amp It Up. You've probably heard of this book, Frank Slootman of Snowflake and ServiceNow, a uh, uh, very respected uh, tech leader, transformative leader. And he basically distilled his philosophy into a book that is very cross-functional. And I thought thought-provoking, ch- you know, challenging in that he is challenging you to be maintain incredibly high standards for performance and, and see through the trees. And so I enjoyed it. Um, other, others may feel, you know, that some areas were great. Others were not, but I enjoyed it pretty much front to back. And then the other book, you know, I live in the Bay area and, and, you know, you can't talk to someone in, in California in particular, but globally without recognizing that homelessness is a problem. And so I'm trying to learn about that problem. It's a symptom of the curiosity, right, Jack? And uh, there's a book that was recommended to me called San Francisco about the, the homeless uh, crisis in San Francisco. I have no idea if it's good or not. For those of you out there, don't take this as a recommendation. But it, it came to me through four or five different people. And so I'm responding to that. But I'm going to read it hopefully once we get uh, budget season fully closed here. Intriguing. Great, great selections for us. Um, I have to say, interestingly enough, we recorded a another CFO this morning who recommended AMP. Oh, so uh, it's uh, and and that's just two in the the last seven days. So, all right. Well, uh, Dan, we are up to our last question. It went quickly for us, so thank you very much. Uh, but we want to have you look forward finally and share your priorities as a CFO over the next twelve months. What would your CFO priorities be? Well, number one, this acquisition it only matters if we execute it correctly, and you know, we're integrating the products, but I also am going to work with our sales and marketing team to help now train the market to understand this is a relatively novel tool and we need to resource the right education and even in some cases the right handholding to get adoption, to get the traction in the market. That's the, the, the pro and the con of establishing, essentially establishing a new software category, although we're, we're folding one in that, that Peter uh, Mahoney, the founder, established. So definitely executing on that. And then I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that we're entering a confusing cycle. Uh, Certainly have had some shocks to the system that started to ripple through in particular technology starting last March. And so we are staying paranoid and making sure that we do right by our company, make the right strategic decisions on where to lean in and pull back in this cycle where things like sales cycles might be getting longer Budgets might be getting slightly less loose in, out in the market. And so we are hyper-focused on monitoring the leading indicators and making the right decision to thrive through any cycle. And Fletcher, thank you for joining us on CFO Thought Leader. It was a pleasure, Jack. Thanks. Thought Leader listeners, as you have perhaps already heard or even seen, we're now featuring the career lessons and moments of strategic insight shared by our CFO guests as Thought Leader videos. You can now find these videos on our blog at cfothoughtleader.com and of course our newsletters, but also on LinkedIn. If you haven't already, please go ahead and follow our CFO Thought Leader LinkedIn company page, and you'll be certain not to miss a single Thought Leader video debut. CFO Thought Leader, the number one thought leadership platform exclusively for and by CFOs. As always, thank you for listening.